But I'll start out by giving an example of implicit memory. And I remember years ago, I was doing an assessment of a woman who had suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder after a severe car accident. She had no memory of the car accident. She also had quite a significant head injury. Uh, she lost consciousness for a significant amount of time and was uh, taken by air ambulance to the hospital in a helicopter. And despite not having memory for the accident, she had significant symptoms of PTSD that involved certain reliving uh, sensory flashes of the accident. She avoided driving on busy highways. And uh, you know, she had a lot of symptoms of depression, inability to experience positive feelings, and a lot of hypervigilance symptoms. And was, what was fascinating uh, was when I assessed her, uh, at the time, I had an office on the 10th floor and the helicopter pad was just below the office. And during the assessment, a helicopter approached the hospital. And the second the helicopter approached the hospital, you know, it's very loud, of course, she went into a total state of being triggered, severe anxiety, hypervigilance. And this was absolutely fascinating to me. It made complete sense, but I think this really shows what implicit memory is, right? She had no explicit memory of the car accident, meaning she did not remember it because she lost consciousness. And yet when she was triggered by a sensory reminder, which was the noise of the helicopter, she, her body was obviously in a very triggered state and she experienced extreme hyperarousal. So she wasn't aware of the memory at a conscious level, but of course, at a subconscious level, she was fully aware of the accident. And she was subject to being triggered by reminders of the accident. Did she understand what was going on with the uh, helicopter? Yes, she did. And we talked about it and we talked about how, you know, it was so strange for her because she couldn't consciously remember the car accident. And yet when she was faced with this trigger, you know, she had these intense hyperarousal responses. And you see that too with uh, people who have uh, endured early childhood abuse where they also don't remember. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So and I think this is something we'll talk about uh, in the webinar. And we have some beautiful data that was actually uh, collected by Daniela Ravellino from our group and analyzed by her. And these data are around heart rate variability. And of course, heart rate variability really relates to your capacity to be able to regulate emotions and is very much associated with health status as well. So the more heart rate variability, in general, the healthier, healthier you are. Right. And what we found was that when people were exposed to subconscious triggers, so triggers that were only presented for 15 milliseconds, so under the level of conscious awareness, their heart rate decreased variability, decreased significantly. And it decreased more as compared to triggers that people were aware of. They also led to decreases in heart rate variability, but less so than to the triggers that were presented at a subliminal level. So that's what we're going to discuss as to why that might make sense. Absolutely. In a survival scenario. Absolutely. Right. Okay. And then how can we think about treatment strategies, right? If so much is going on below the level of our conscious awareness, you know, how can we Think about that in terms of treatment, bottom-up treatments, neurofeedback, body-oriented treatments. Yeah, how can we make sense of that? And how can we really facilitate the implicit to become explicit or the subconscious to become conscious so we can work with it much more directly? You know, having been somebody who has lived through this process, I would say that, you know, I tried every approach to working with these uh, implicit, unreachable memories. And I needed and, and benefited greatly from psychotherapy. 
But it was only when I added neurofeedback or when neurofeedback became a regular part of my routine that I was able to experience and then understand that everything was occluded from me. I couldn't remember things because of the high level of arousal. And when uh, the arousal started to go down, because I was, that was what I was training to do, to quiet uh, and to bring on more emotional regulation, then I had more access to these uh, memories. But I think Ruth is right. It's, it's, much, it's much more. There's a whole system of knowing that is underneath consciousness that we could call it the subconscious or the unconscious, but it is, it is out of reach because uh, I think, in my experience anyway, because of the level of fear that was embedded in them. And I think that's what, you know, what we could end up talking about. And I think it's important to clarify, it's out of reach in terms of a narrative. Yeah. But it's not out of reach in terms of body, bodily yes. reactions. Exactly. Right? Okay. And I think that's really critical to keep in mind. Perfect. Yeah. And, but, it's, but the narrative is what makes it possible. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, you, you know, that is exactly the journey from the implicit to the explicit. Exactly. It's yeah. from sensory memory to creating a narrative. Absolutely. Yeah. 